Hi, I'm Krista Jacobson, headmistress of the Budodikai. Today we're going to discuss ninjutsu training, Goho no Keiko lesson number two. If you've not already seen Goho no Keiko lesson number one, please go back and watch that video because there's so much information in that video that you will need to have to understand what we're talking about in this series. In lesson number one, we discussed the Goho no Keiko and the five areas of ninjutsu training here at the Budo Dikai. We discussed in depth what each of those five areas are. We talked about the elemental aspect of each one, and we talked about the philosophy of each one of those areas of training. So if you've not already seen lesson number one, you're going to miss so much that we're going to talk about in lesson number two. So please go back and watch lesson number one before you finish this video. In this video here, Goho no Keiko lesson number two, we're going to talk about why the Goho no Keiko was created. I feel that all students of the Budo Dikai should understand why the Goho no Keiko was created. That way they understand how to use the Goho no Keiko as a tool to make themselves a better martial artist. Now before we get into the meat and potatoes of this whole thing, I think it's very important to talk about my mentality towards martial arts training. Before I was a martial arts teacher, I owned a health club. I was a personal trainer. Um, I had a very successful health club and uh, I did very well um, in personal training. I had a very good reputation. I had lots of clients. My health club was uh, very successful. I had a whole training staff. Um, at my health club that was under me and uh, we did very good. I did very well in the uh, health and fitness industry. In 2004 I decided to close my health club and uh, just teach martial arts. I decided to leave health and fitness and to take on a new challenge uh, in the martial arts and um, that's where I decided to create Budo Di Ninjutsu. When I created Budo Di Ninjutsu, when I created the art of Budo Di Ninjutsu, I did it just like I would in the world of personal training. Um, as a personal trainer, um, I worked with many different types of people. Mainly, for me, as a personal trainer, I worked with athletes. I used to teach uh, and coach bodybuilding and take them to competition. Myself, I was an athlete and I did compete at a very high level. And um, I enjoyed competition. I enjoyed um, competing, meeting goals, uh, devising a new plan on how people can meet their goals. And if that didn't work, you know, regroup and figure out a way for everyone, regardless of whether they're an athlete um, or they're not an athlete, to be able to get the goals that they wanted through health and fitness and through training. Now, there's a big difference between training with people who are athletes and training with people who are not athletes. It's a huge difference. Um, either way, the, for me, the competition was still the same. I enjoyed working with people to help them meet their goals. So when I left the health and fitness uh, industry and I stopped being a personal trainer and I started the Budo Yukai in 2004, I developed the system the same way that I would initially start with every client. When you look at someone who walks in and they have a general fitness goal, not someone specific like an athlete that's meeting the deadline before competition. I'm talking about general fitness goals. You sit down and you're going to have certain areas that you're going to talk about and you're going to make sure that you oversee through their training so that they can meet their goal. An example, if someone says, you know, I'd like to increase strength, uh, I, I, I'm weak, I'd like to be stronger, um, I'd like my core lifts to be better, um, I'd like to lean these areas out, um, I'd like to be more toned or muscular or ripped, whatever it is, terms you guys want to use, uh, in certain areas. The first thing that you're going to do is say, okay, the first thing we need to do is we need to have core lifts. Everyone's going to have core lifts. It doesn't matter whether you're a bodybuilder, whether you're a pro football player, whether you're a pro wrestler, whether you're a basketball player, or whether you're a stay-at-home mom. It doesn't matter. You're going to have core lifts because the core lifts are functional training on how the body actually operates. So everyone's going to do squats. Everyone's going to do bench. Everyone's going to do a form of a deadlift. Everyone's going to do, and that doesn't mean just because you're doing deadlifts that you have to be maxing out and doing triples and singles. But everyone's going to have certain core lifts that they're going to do. They're going to have that core training because that core training is how the body moves. The second section of weight training is going to be what's added onto that. Let's say that they want to have more toned muscles. Well, instead of doing like cling and press or deadlifts or something along those lines, we might work on single joint movements like tricep pushdowns or maybe preacher curls. Uh, maybe if they're trying to get more definition in their legs, we might do a single, a single joint lift like a leg extension or a leg curl 
typically speaking, when you do strength training, you move more than one joint. And when you do um, toning and firming and or trying to lean out and get more ripped, you move a single joint. So uh, to put on strength, you do a bench press, which obviously is the elbows and shoulders, and you're moving multiple joints. Where um, if you get more of a leaner look, you would move a single joint, like a tricep push down or maybe a fly. That way you would um, put more emphasis on a single specific part of the muscle. So that second section of training, that second set where you're moving single joints, that would all be based on the client's goal of what they wanted. The third area of training that we're going to look at is going to be nutrition. Supplemental training. You have to understand nutrition because what you eat is what fuels your body to look and act and react the way that it does. So you have to understand nutrition. The next section of what we're going to overlook is we're going to overlook supplements. And supplements are very key because most people don't eat correctly. Most people don't get enough fruits and vegetables. And I'm not talking about, you know, creatine or testosterone supplements or, you know, I'm not talking about things that um, uh, bodybuilders or athletes would use for enhanced performance. I'm talking about nutritional supplements because the majority of people do not eat correctly. The majority of people do not get in enough fruits and vegetables. The majority of people do not drink enough water. The majority of people do not get enough antioxidants in their diet to help clean the skin and do the things that it needs to do just to work properly. So supplements is another area of training that we would have to look at. The last area of training that we're going to look at is how the body is reacting off of everything and the mind. Where are you mentally? How do you think the process is going? What really is the process? We got to check their weight. We got to check their measurements. We got to know all these different things. So you're always going to have that fifth area of training that doesn't really have a, I don't want to say, it doesn't really have a title. It's just that one thing that you got to do that just brings it all together. It's almost like void. It's there, but it's not really specific. It's all those things that you got to put together with each client differently to make their outcome better. So no matter what client I have, I know there's going to be core lifts. I know there's going to be secondary training uh, for conditioning that's going to be based on their what they want. There's going to be nutrition and intake. There's going to be supplementation, the stuff that you do outside of actual nutrition and training. And then there's going to be that void area of what we're going to do to make this individual better. If you have specific areas that you know has to be at a high level, when one of those areas tend to drop, it's easy to identify what the problem is and it's easy to identify how to fix it. That way you can get every client, regardless of what their goal is, towards the goal that they want. When I started the Budo Dikai in 2004, I did the same thing. First thing that we need to have is uh, we needed to have core training. That's the seven warrior traditions. There you go. We need to have that core training. Now, the re and again, the reason I'm going over this is I want you guys to know that I was a personal trainer by trade. By, by trade, that's what I did. I was a fitness trainer. I was a personal trainer. And when I, when I designed Budo Dini Jiu Jitsu, I designed it with the same intent. That way, people could come in and train. And if there was a lack in progress, if there was something that wasn't getting up to par so that they could actually keep progressing, it was very easy to pinpoint what the problem is. That way, we can say, okay, this is where you're lacking. You need to do this. You need to do this. And we can pull the parts out and then have them work it. When you don't have these five areas of training, what ends up happening is, let's say that you go to a Taekwondo school, and again, you go to a Taekwondo school or a Kempo school or Kung Fu or you know Wing Chun, Krav Maga, whatever it is that you want to do. Every martial art is comprised of many different types of training. It's not like you go in, you work a few moves, and you leave. Um, there's going to be a certain area of physical conditioning. There's going to be a certain area of sparring, I'm sure, uh, techniques, application, etc etc that's always going to be there but it's always wrapped up underneath one umbrella it's wrapped up as taekwondo study taekwondo okay well if you start lacking it's very hard to as a trainer it's really hard to dissect exactly where the problems are if they keep coming to class and they're very consistent and you don't know where the problems tend to be and the reason I say that is because you get a lot of schools where you get people who are very consistent and they, they're dedicated to the dojo and they show up their classes every week and then they end up getting black belts but they're not that good. We see that all the time. People who are dedicated in other martial arts um, and 
they get black belts, but they don't have any skills. And that's because usually, not always, but usually it's because the trainer is teaching a specific art, which is an umbrella for a whole bunch of stuff. And they keep showing up, they keep showing up, so they just base it on time in, and then here's your belt. Here it's different. Here you have to have a specific amount of skill in all five areas, and it has to be graded equally. That way you can progress through the system. I can say this, you know, I've said this a million times on uh, Facebook, Twitter, social media, etc. You know, the Budo Dikai started in 2004. We've been in business for 12 years now, and in 12 years I still have less than 20 black belts. Actually, it might be around 10 black belts. I just, I don't have that many because I don't give rank unless it's earned. This might be one of the toughest schools to get a black belt in, to be quite honest with you. I just don't hand them out very often. I mean, you got to be pretty good uh, to get a black belt and uh, to progress through the training. Usually, once they hit black, then it becomes a whole nother type of, uh, another experience and a whole nother level of things that are expected. But, um, yeah, so I think sometimes people miss that they see that we have the, all these different schools, we have thousands of students in the online university, and I think the expectation is that I have hundreds of black belts. I have less than 20 black belts. I don't have that many. It's right around 10, give or take. My black belt number is right around 10. You have to earn that. It's not something that you get just because you show up, you know, three or four times a week or you're dedicated to the dojo. Everything has to be based on what you can do. Um, Self-defense is based on what you can do. Self-protection is what is based on what you can do. Uh, success is based on what you can do. So I think martial arts rank and recognition should be based on what you can do, not based on the fact that you're loyal. So when you look at the Goho no Keiko, or the five areas of ninjutsu training here at the Budo Rikai, what you see is the Nana Musha Den, the seven warrior traditions the Gendai Hinkawaza, the modern variation techniques of the seven traditions, Hojo and Do, supplemental training, Nihon Mushukyu, which is the study of the samurai and ninja scrolls, study of the ancient warrior, and then Seshi Teki Kyoyo, which is spiritual refinement. Now, how does that break down, and how do we look at that in an area that helps the student become a better student? The first one, Nanamusha Den. The Nanamusha Den are the seven warrior traditions. Those are that's what connects us to the past. Those are these, these ancient techniques, these historical techniques, they're, they're based on war and that they have been passed down and we have them now. So we train in those traditions to help us get a core base knowledge and a base level skill within the martial arts. Now from that, we need to grow. From that, we need to have added skills in the martial arts to become even better, to round out the training, to make our skills even better. Not in a core perspective, but even better. That's the Gendai Hinko Waza. That's taking those old kata, those old waza, and making them fit in the modern day. That way we can apply it now. We can get the goals that we want, we can protect ourselves, protect the ones that we love, and it easily fits in the time that we live. Now, most of those kata that are in the seven traditions actually do and can easily fit into this world. However, a lot of them can't. And you have to be able to understand what was set at that time and what can be working at this time. And that aspect of training is very important because hinka or variations is very important to understand the truth and the essence of all of the seven traditions that we have. So not only do we have our base training with the seven warrior traditions of the Nanamusha Din, but we also have that next level training and those ex that extra set of training of the Gendai Hinka Waza or the modern variations and training, combat training from the old traditions. The third area of training is Hoju and Do, and that's a supplemental training, strength training, cardiovascular training, skin and bone conditioning, right? Survival training, these type of things, understanding all these aspects of supplemental exercises or supplemental training to make your martial arts better. That's what Hojo Wando is. And you have to have that. You have to understand how to make your body stronger, how to make your cardiovascular system stronger, how to make your skin and bones um, stronger, how survival skills in, in our dojo is very important, which fits underneath um, Hojo Wando. That is something that's very important and very much trained. And that has to be there to make the rest of the tradition better, to make you better at those traditions. Because if you can make yourself better and stronger, you can make your techniques better and stronger. Now, the fourth era of training is Nihon Mushikyu, and that's the study of the ancient scrolls. I think it's very important that all of my students in the Budo Yukai study the historical text. 
There are so many martial arts schools out there that they, they teach ninjutsu or bujutsu or whatever, right? They study martial art or they teach a martial art and they tell their students, don't read those books. Only read my books. Don't read those books. I think it's crap. I think all students should educate themselves as much as they can and use as much information as possible. These traditions that we have, whether it's uh, Eishin Ryu, Tagaku Ryu, Koto Ryu, Gyokko Ryu, you know, our Jujutsu schools, our Kenpo training, Tomo Ryu, da da da, all this kind of stuff. Through Kuden, right, because they were all way before me, but through Kuden, they're all from that time. If they're from that time, that means it should fit in the historical documents. It should fit. So educating yourself with the Ban Senshukai, the Nenpaden, the Shodenki, or any of the scrolls that I've collected through my training and my research, all those things that we have, I think it's important for all the students to study it. That way they understand what history says. Because if you understand what history says and you get a better idea of what the ninja and samurai really are, it makes it very easy to understand what you're supposed to be doing with the traditions that we have. So all of this tends to come together. The last area of training, Seshi Teki Kyoyo, spiritual refinement. This is that checks and balances that I'm talking about. Um, seshi te when we talk about Seshi Teki Kyoyo, it's not always about religion. Anybody can be whatever religion they want, but there are certain things on our body, we call them chakra, that are energies, that we wanna make sure that all of our energy is flowing properly. There's an energy around all of us, and I'm really big on connecting to the universe, connecting to the elements, and um, being part of nature. We are part of nature, and we should study and, and be so natural that we're connected to nature. And I think that spiritual refinement of being able to understand your surroundings, understand um, how you fit within each element, how to take each element and use it to your advantage, understand your connection to every living thing around you. All those things are very important uh, and a very um, integral part of Seshi Teki Kyoyo within Burodi Ninjutsu. I think that uh, the idea of being able to train in spiritual refinement is ve something very intimate to my heart. And hopefully as my students progress through Burodi Ninjutsu, they understand what Seshi Teki Kyoyo truly is. And um, because it's something that I feel that you cannot leave that section out if you're going to be a true martial artist. I think it doesn't take talent to beat someone's ass. Anybody can learn fighting techniques and be a good fighter and be a good warrior, but that doesn't make them a martial artist. That doesn't make them a true balanced person of mind and body and balanced character. You have to have true spiritual refinement to understand that. And that's why Seshi Teki Kyoyo is so important. So when looking at the Goho no Keiko, I think it's very important to understand why I developed it. If you have a student that walks into the dojo and they know the kata really well, but they know that we have certain testing protocols and their numbers have to be at a certain percentage to be able to pass and move to the next level. It's very easy for me to say, you know, you do know your kata really well, but your conditioning isn't good. And it isn't your sparring section of Hojo and Do, it's your conditioning section of Kojo and Do. That's why you're not progressing. You need to have a certain level of conditioning to be able to move to the next level. Or if we're, we're studying each one of these levels and I'm like, you know, you're really good at conditioning and sparring and your modern variation techniques are really good, but look at what you've done with your kata. These katas aren't good. Or you don't know any of the oral exam. For those of you guys who are new and you guys are watching this video, we, there's an oral exam on every single level um, as you progress through black belt. That way, um, people understand that there are um, the truths and the facts of ninjutsu. Um, there's two, there's one oral exam, which is pretty much comprised of two sections. You have kuden, which are the things that are connected to the traditions. And uh, those are the things that have been passed down through verbal transmission throughout the years. We also have a section called historical shinobi jutsu. And the historical shinobi jutsu are the things that we get from historical scrolls that I can say, this comes from this scroll, it was written on this day by this person, and they're facts. And uh, so that's the, you know, and that's what that is. And we've talked before about what the difference in truth and fact is. Truth is what you believe, fact is what you can prove. Um, you can believe in God, but you can't prove God. I can, I can prove that I'm wearing a black kimono right now. That's a fact. Um, it's the truth that I enjoy wearing a black kimono. 
but it's a fact that I'm wearing a black kimono. So understanding kyojutsu, which is the truth and falsehood, or the art of misdirection. If you're going to truly study ninjutsu, you should understand what kyojutsu is. And kyojutsu, which is a very important aspect of ninjutsu, is understanding fundamentally the difference between truth and fact. And that is the fundamental difference of truth and fact. So when you look at um, the oral exam, maybe when they're studying their levels, they know the kata, they're pretty good with the modern techniques, their conditioning's good, but when they sit down to do the oral exam, it's like, you know, okay, what are the five spies? I don't know. What's the seven disguises found in this? What's the six tools found here? What, you know, what are the five spies found here? What are the, you know, and all these kind of things. And maybe they don't know. Maybe they never wrote it down in their notes that day in training. And that's what's going to keep them from progressing because you have to know where you're coming from to know where you're going. And those aspects of training is something that we look at because here we try to have a system that makes a complete martial artist, not just one focused in one specific area of training. So if you guys have stuck with me this far in the video, that is the reason why I developed the Go no Keiko. I want people to be able to study and be a complete martial artist. I designed it just like I was a personal trainer. I wanted people to know, yes, we do traditional kata. Yes, we do modern variation techniques. Yes, we're gonna come in and we're gonna do conditioning and conditioning is gonna be required on every single level. Yes, we're gonna study from the historical scrolls. And yes, there's gonna be aspects of seshi teki kyoyo that I feel have to be practiced to make yourself a better martial artist. There are so many schools out there that's like, yes, we are a traditional school and we teach these traditions, but they don't do anything modern. They don't have any conditioning. You got these fat, overweight lugs that, you know, that have umpteen degree black belts and they got their guts hanging over their, their hips and they got these big old guts on them. How does that even make sense? You're training in martial arts to make yourself an efficient weapon. How can you be an efficient weapon when you got a big old fat ass, you know, and you can't even freaking run up, run up a damn flight of stairs if you had to. You know, your house is on fire, you're gonna have a heart attack before you run out of the damn thing. It's like it doesn't even make sense that you have these martial art masters that are completely out of shape when the weapon that they're training is their body and they don't even keep care of their weapon. It makes no sense to me. That's why Hoja Wando in our school is so important. I'll be damned if we have that kind of martial artist in the Budodikai. It will never happen. You have to be in shape. You have to be in condition. If you're not, you're just not going to progress. It's just that simple. I also think that it's very important that we have to study from the scrolls. So you have these groups of so you have these groups of people that only study from books, which is great, but they don't do anything else. To me, it's an area of training. It's not the area of training. Same thing with Seshi Teki Kyoyo. If you look at the five areas of training, what you really see are five areas that I feel are important for all martial artists. That's why that is Budo Di Ninjutsu. That is Budo Di Ninjutsu. However, you have some martial arts like not many traditions, and then you have other. No, we're a modern we're a modern school that teaches modern tactics. And then you have other people, it's like, yeah, we're kickboxing school, we're gonna get yourself in condition, and hit the bags, and, and they just hold your window. It's all about physical conditioning. And then you got other people, it's like, well, they're not, well, we're not martial artists, but we're study groups, and we study from the scrolls. And then you got these people with internal arts, you know, like Tai Chi or something like this. And like, no, we're just gonna focus on chakra, and we're gonna focus on energy, and we're gonna meditate. Well, why does everyone have to choose one thing and go with it? But I'm just saying that I think it's important to not just study one. It should be part of your training. And that is Budodi Ninjutsu. Every aspect of these five areas comprises of 20% of the curriculum. So when you look at Budodi Ninjutsu, what is Budodi Ninjutsu? Budodi Ninjutsu, it encompasses those five areas. That's the, it's, it's to submerge yourself into the arts, be the best you can be, and then understand through the training, what area of these five am I lacking in? And you can easily pinpoint it so that you can make that section better. So this was Goho no Keiko lesson number two. I hope that you guys understand why the Goho no Keiko was created and how we implement it within the Buddha Dikai. I'll be making lesson number three very shortly so that every student of the Buddha Dikai will understand how to apply all five areas of training equally to every training session. Thank you guys very much for all of your love and support. I deeply appreciate it. Until next time, take care, be safe. And good luck in your journey of Buddha.